side of my life uh, is a recent development because by calling, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, a commercial lawyer. But I think it's an extension of the work that a lawyer does in terms of investigating evidence. Absolutely, if yes. You have yes. A, if you have an interest in history, uh, you do tend to apply the same skills and disciplines to follow the trail. I mean, I, I'm, in that respect, I think I'm slightly different from your conventional historian. Uh, yes. Because I'm very much evidence-led, uh, and I do look for the, just like in, in, in trials, the witness is not going to confess to everything. And you, you've got to establish and reconstruct the events uh, on the basis of the available evidence. And there are times when you're going to have to draw inferences from the available evidence yeah. uh, that will take you to a logical conclusion uh, on, on, in the absence of um, rebutting evidence. Uh, and uh, Nigeria's history is like a great criminal trial. <laughs> True, in, in that sense. Both, both, both uh, modern, pre-colonial as well as colonial. In, absolutely, in absolutely. In they, they are skeletons and, and dead bodies all along the trail. And uh, you, you've got to sort of piece it together in order to find out who the culprits are, uh, what exactly happened, uh, how it happened, uh, because the culprits, of course, are going to hide the evidence. That That is the striking parallel uh, between um, uh, legal cases. Or sometimes the, the, the culprits will write their own version of the history. Yes, indeed. They, they will write their own version of the history. Again, um, they, it's, it's like the, the culprit who comes to court, he's going to give his own version of the events, which will tend yeah. to... Uh, he'll come with his alibi saying, I wasn't there, it wasn't me. And it's down to us to critically examine the evidence that's put before us. However convincing the book might look, however authoritative the historian might appear, we've got to have the courage to lift the veil, dig deep, uh, test and, um, and ask questions. And if it does not make sense, we must be prepared to say that story is not credible. There's a new book that I've brought out uh, titled A Slave Ship Called Jesus. Uh, people's first reaction to the title of that book is that it sounds like an attack on Christianity. Well, it isn't. Uh, there was a slave ship called the Jesus of Lübeck. And I was curious as to why it was that in an evil trade like slavery, the ships um, would bear such devout names. Another ship was called the Grace of God. Now, that book, the research in that book, has actually added to my understanding of what happened in Nigeria and how we got to where we are. Uh, it, it has taken it to a, a higher level because there, from there, you get an understanding of the role of Sierra Leone in the making of Nigeria. You get an understanding of why the Ajayi Crowthers came from that geographical space. You also get an understanding of when you look at the map of West Africa and you look at the location of that first British colony, Sierra Leone, and you see the proximity of that place to the place where the Fulani originated from in that uh, Senegambia area, your understanding of the Nigeria story will become even deeper. So in a nutshell, what uh, I cover the, the process uh, the, 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 a fabulous people starts with abolition of the slave trade. That is the genesis of the colonization project. And it explains the real reason. You've got to understand the real reason for abolition in order to understand how and why colonization then followed. You see, the narrative 
that uh, the British and the West pushed in terms of the reasons for abolition of the slave trade was that it was a humanitarian exercise. They uh, had an epiphany and it dawned on them that slavery and the slave trade was immoral. But ask yourself, if that was the case, why did colonization, which is equally immoral, why did it follow immediately afterwards? It is often also said that, ah, well, slave, slavery became uneconomic because of the Industrial Revolution. But how can that be correct? Because if you gave me free labor in my law practice today and said that I didn't have to pay, I would take it. So free labor never becomes uneconomic. There must be a different explanation. The real, as I explained in Fabulous, the real explanation for abolition of the slave trade uh, was actually the loss by Britain of America as a colony. Because up until then, uh, they were the uh, lead players in the trade. And the name of the game was labor was free from our area. Labor was free, so therefore you needed land in which to deploy the free labor. And at that time, France had Canada and parts of what we now regard as British America, Louisiana and places like that. Spain had a whole of Latin America. Portugal had Brazil. So everybody had their repositories. But when America was lost, that now reduced uh, Britain in terms of the, 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 the territory in which you could uh, deploy uh, the labor, limited to uh, Jamaica as its main repository and Barbados and a few of those small Caribbean islands. That was the impetus for uh, changing the game, partly to starve the newly independent America of the supply line of slaves which America itself was relying upon in order to make the new independent uh, colony viable. So to shut off the supply, that was part of the calculation. And what led to the colonization of Sierra Leone, I explained, was the pledge that Britain had made to the enslaved peoples, our peoples, uh, to fight for them in that American War of Independence. And when the Americans then matched the bargain and said, you fight for us, and when we win, we will free you. So come the end of the war, both sides had made commitments to the enslaved peoples who had fought for them, to freedom. Now, they did not want a multicultural society at that point. They don't want a multicultural society now speak less of a multicultural America or multicultural Britain as at the end of the American War of Independence in 1783. So what were they to do with them? They now put their heads together and agreed a plan by which these unwanted Africans would now be shipped off. That was the genesis of Sierra Leone. And in America's case, that was the genesis of Liberia. But having now colonized, in Britain's case, having now colonized that territory uh, in West Africa, which is, we now know as Sierra Leone, and used it as a base for the return of the unwanted Africans, they now sought to train them up, skill them up in the languages, in the skill sets. Many were deployed into what became the West African Frontier Force. Bear in mind, many of them still had the language. These were relatively recent um, uh, recruits into the slave trade or into slavery. Many of them still had the languages, the Hausa, the Igbos, the Yoruba language. These were then used as the pathfinders in order to penetrate uh, the, uh, the wider West African uh, uh, space with a view to constructing uh, the uh, colony. Now, uh, I, I do explain that in, in the book that the original plan was that Nigeria was actually going to be a huge colony covering the whole, virtually the whole of West Africa. When you look at the map and you understand how 
this French presence was interpersed, interspersed, it was simply because of a diplomatic understanding between them. Because bear in mind, Britain had already taken the large chunks of southern Africa, where France did not have a presence. If you look at the map of Africa, you see that France does not have a presence in southern Africa. And so it was a trade-off to allow the French slices of the action along our territorial space. Now, when we now come to Nigeria, more specifically, to really understand the story, you've got to actually go beyond Lugard and beyond Goldie. There's a gentleman that doesn't get sufficient attention in uh, many of the uh, commentary, but he actually is the grand architect of Nigeria. He was the boss of Lugard. He was the boss of Goldie. That gentleman was the colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain. Now, I've taken a special interest in uh, Chamberlain. Uh, his nickname was Joseph Africanus Chamberlain. He was the ultimate imperialist. He was the colonial secretary in the period from 1895 up until 1906, the longest serving colonial secretary. His biography runs into six volumes. Each volume is over 500 pages. I've read every single one of those volumes from cover to cover. And there you get a deeper understanding of the Nigeria story. He was known as Joseph Africanus rather than Joseph Nigerianus, if you like, because his brief extended to the whole of Africa. You see, he had a vision for the unification of the British Empire as a political entity. He wanted it to be like the United States of America. Unification, that federation that he was trying to build, embraced Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, as well as Nigeria. Now, the background to uh, his conquest of the North was actually a war. So what you saw and uh, uh, what uh, Basil was outlining in terms of the process by which the North was conquered had actually been played out in South Africa in the Boer War, which ended in 1902. At the time Lugard uh, launched his conquest of the Sokoto Caliphate, Chamberlain was actually in South Africa. Lugard did not get his authority to conquer Sokoto from the colonial office. He got it from Chamberlain. He bypassed, it was all kept secret. He bypassed the colonial office and got these instructions uh, from Chamberlain. Now, here's an important detail. It's not in Fatherless. It will be in the later edition. But here's an important detail. The area of Nigeria, which is the Sokoto Caliphate, as well as Bornu, all that, if you look at the map of West Africa, you'll see that Nigeria on that map stands taller than uh, other countries uh, along the uh, that West Coast. Stands taller than Ivory Coast, taller than uh, Ghana, Togo, Benin. The reason for that is this. There was a secret deal that was done 
in 1898 between the French and the British. Bear in mind this was Berlin conference had already happened where the principles for the carve up, I call Berlin conference as the feast of the cannibals because they were seated around that grand dining table. And you can imagine a, a, a picture uh, Africa being uh, personified almost or depicted as a, as a huge antelope on the table. And each of these European powers were haggling over which parts of, of, of that uh, wildebeest uh, was going to be uh, belong to who. I'll have the leg, I'll have the shoulder, I'll have a slice of the breast. So at Berlin, the principles have been agreed the broad principles. It was now a problem of the detail. So that's why when you look at the map of West Africa, you will see that the lines are very straight. They were broadly straight lines. And the criteria that was being applied, that it was agreed, was effective presence, boots on the ground. Now, when it came to that space, that we're discussing the conquest of the caliphates, northern Nigeria. The backdrop to it was that, that deal that was done between the French and the British in 1898. And the subject matter of that was Madagascar. There was a secret deal by which there was a trade-off. Britain and uh, France were haggling for space. Both of them had staked a claim to Madagascar. You know, Madagascar is on the east coast of Africa, uh, just off the coast of uh, Mozambique. And as I said earlier, the French had no presence in the southern part of Africa. What was agreed was that Britain would release its claim for territory in Madagascar so that the French could have the whole of that island in return for Britain getting an extra slice of the action in what became Nigeria. And that extra slice of the action is that, if you call it the sort of the loft the bit of Nigeria that stands above Benin, Togo, Ghana, the area that we're now discussing in terms of the conquest of northern Nigeria. Uh, 